Hello, everybody. We have a special guest tonight who's helping out. Yeah. And we are on page. Uh, 123 in the hardbound edition. So I'm, I'm so amazed to see everybody here. We've got uh, Lawrence is here, Shaman is here, Justice is here, Shell is here. So yeah, lots of people here early. You guys are, are good students. So gold star for all of you for showing up early. And then, of course, Mantis is helping out with the reading tonight. And thank God, because we've got that snowpocalypse that's heading in. And my head is killing me. So, yeah. I, uh, <sighs> yeah. Um, migraine. Uh, already here. But I wanted to be here because I didn't have enough time <laughs> to cancel it. And Mantis is helping. So I figured that I can I can pull through anyway. So she's making all sorts of concern faces. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I'm a trooper. Just make it your mic. Your mic not too bad. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So. All right. So yeah, page 123. We're in rule five. This is don't let your kids do anything that would um, make you not like them. So. Parent or friend, the neglect and mistreatment that is part and parcel of poorly structured or even entirely absent disciplinary approaches can be deliberate, motivated by explicit, conscious, if misguided, parental motives. But more often than not, modern parents are simply paralyzed by their fear that they will no longer be liked or even loved by their children if they chastise them for any reason. Hey, survival's in the house. Right on. Um, hey, survival. Yeah. So they want their children's friendship above all and are willing to sacrifice respect to get it. This is not good. A child will have many friends, but only two parents, if that. And the parents are more, not less, than friends. Friends have very limited authority to correct. Every parent, therefore, needs to learn to tolerate the momentary anger or even hatred directed towards them by their children after necessary corrective action has been taken. As the capacity of children to perceive or even care about long-term consequences is very limited. That's for sure. Parents are the arbiters of society. They teach children how to behave so that other people will be able to interact meaningful and productively with them. It is, a, and haven't you met these parents where they're like best friends with their kids? And it's kind of creepy, you know? It's like the mom is, you know, all sorts of like teenager and everything like that. And it's like, you're 45, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> you're not 15. You know, and and it's just, yeah, it's a little it's a little creepy to me that these parents want to be best friends with their kids. It's like, no, your your parents, you know, that to to yeah to want to be friends with your daughter and friends with her friends and stuff like that. It's it's dangerous. It's like, okay, who who's the adult in the situation here? You know, everybody's a kid. Um, survival says, uh, I had friends who were friends with their dads. They turned out bad. Yep. Um, justice says I've met parents that act younger than their kids. Oh my gosh. What a travesty. That is just no. So, Oh, Samantha's in the house. I miss Samantha. Um, Justice says, party with their kids, hang out with their kids' friends. It's sad. It is sad. It's very, it's like, it's like they're trying not to grow up. Uh, you know, they've got like a Peter Pan syndrome or something like that. They, you know, they, they always want to be a kid. And it's like, no, I mean, how are you supposed to learn adult responsibility 
and how to function in an adult world if you're if your parents are never adults if they never act like adults around you that's just it's just bad you know <laughs> i mean i can understand acting like a kid sometimes but if you're in a whole group of young people and you're acting younger or as young as the rest of them then who's going to take the lead in that instance exactly you being an adult you're always going to be the responsible party so if things go south it's on you yep yep precisely so all right do you want to take it next we're at the top of 24 uh par parents are the arbiters of society um where is it active responsibility to discipline uh yeah the active responsibility it is an active responsibility to discipline a child it is not anger at misbehavior it is not revenge for a misdeed it is instead a careful combination of mercy and long-term judgment proper discipline requires effort and deed is virtually synonymous with effort it is difficult to pay careful attention to children. It is difficult to figure out what is wrong and what is right and why. It is difficult to formulate just and compassionate strategies of discipline and to negotiate their application with others deeply involved in a child's care. Because of this combination of responsibility and difficulty, any suggestion that all constraints placed on children are damaging can be perversely welcome. Such a notion once accepted allows adults who should know better to abandon their duty to service agents of enculturation and pretend that doing so is good for children. It's a deep and pernicious act of self-deception. It's lazy, cruel, and inexcusable, and our proclivity to rationalize does not end there. We assume that rules will, will intermediate intermediately inhibit what would otherwise be the boundless and intrinsic creativity of our children. Even though the scientific literature clearly indicates, first, that creativity beyond the trivial is shockingly rare, and second, that strict limitations facilitate rather than inhibit creative achievement. Belief in the purely destructive element of rules and structure, structure is frequently conjoined with the idea that children will make good choices about when to sleep and what to eat if their perfect natures are merely allowed to manifest themselves. These are equally undergrounded assumptions. Children are perfectly capable of attempting to subsist on hot dogs, chicken fingers, and fruit loops, if doing so will attract attention, provide power, or shield them from trying anything new. Instead of going to bed wisely and peacefully, children will fight nighttime unconsciousness until they stagger by fatigue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are also perfectly willing to provoke adults while exploring the complex contours of the social environment, just like juvenile chimps harassing the adults and their troops. Observing the consequences of teasing and taunting enables chimp and child alike to discover the limits of what might otherwise be a too structured and terrifying freedom. Such limits, when discovered, provide security even if their detection causes momentary disappointment or frustration. All right, let's pause for a second. We got uh, Samantha made, made a comment. Isn't there a healthy medium like, well, partying is way no, but I do ask my daughter how she feels about things. My mom couldn't care less how I felt. I was never allowed to practice making decisions. Justice says I was always one, the one to go to their house and watch the kids because she never would. My parents always ask me about decisions before they make them, and I'm a 22-year-old adult. Uh, survival says it's, I think it's probably a different thing between mothers and daughters than fathers and sons. Um, Shaman says it's good to be approachable. I agree with that. Uh, and then Samantha says, I just don't want my daughter's first time making life decisions to be one day she turns 18. Obviously, we aren't friends, but I do take how she feels into consideration like in between friend and authoritarian. Yes, it's it's a it's a line you have to walk, you know. I mean, obviously you want your kids to love you. But what Jordan is talking about here is abandoning the the responsibility of of that adult authority figure. And I don't think that you're doing that, Samantha, you know. 
I, I understand that, you know, your mom was way too distant. And I don't think he's talking about being distant. I think he's talking about, you know, not being too close and, and being the person who can set the boundaries and the rules and things like that. What do you think, Mantis? I agree. I mean, it's a it's a very, very fine line to walk. And it definitely is. The, uh, there is a difference between father and son relationships and mother daughter relationships. And I'm sometimes there will always be things that my son's not comfortable talking to me about or making decisions about. So he'll go to his father. And I think that's only fair, just like my daughter coming to me, because I don't think like a man. Yep. I just don't. And I don't think like a dad. Yep. So, okay, we, we've caught up on, uh, oh, wait, no. Uh, Survival says, I think there's a certain age after about 30 where you can definitely become friends with a parent. Yes, that's, that's the age. When you become an adult and you're making adult decisions, that's when you can really be friends with your parents. But before that, they have to be teacher. They have to be lawmaker, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, I definitely agree with that. Yes, I, I'm definitely a friend of my mom now. And it took me moving away and yeah, before we could really hit our stride. And I love her. We can talk about pretty much anything now, no matter whether we disagree or not. We we definitely are on the same page. It helps. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So all right, you want to jump back into it? Yes. I remember taking my daughter to the playground once when she was about two. She was playing on the monkey bars hanging in midair. A particularly provocative little monster about the same age was standing above her on the same bar she was gripping. I watched him move towards her. Our eyes locked. He slowly and deliberately stepped on her hands. Ooh. With increasing force over and over as he stared me down. Oh, what a little stinker. He knew exactly what he was doing. Up yours, Daddy O. That was his philosophy. He had already concluded that adults were contemptible and that he could safely defy them. Too bad, then, that he was destined to become one. That was the hopeless future his parents had titled him with. To his great and celebratory shock, I picked him bodily off the playground structure and threw him 30 feet down the field. Whoa. No, I didn't. <laughs> he tricked us. I yeah. just took my daughter somewhere else but it would have been better for him if I had. Imagine a toddler repeatedly striking his mother in the face. Why would he do such a thing? It's a stupid question. It's unacceptably naive. The answer is obvious, to dom dominate his mother, to see if he can get away with it. Violence, after all, is no mystery. It's peace, that's mystery. Violence is the default. It's easy. It's peace that is difficult. Learned and calculated earned and in, in, it's incalculated right and inculcated. i've never come across inculcated. that word. and in, inculcated yeah inculcated. interesting i'm gonna have to add that to my list. <laughs> definitely gonna add that, add that to my list and of course my pencil but, pardon me i always do this every time i find a word that i don't recognize i yeah, underline I I've seen that word before, but yeah. So um, people often get basic psychological questions backwards. Why do people take drugs? Not a mystery. It's why they don't take them. Don't take them all that it's a mystery. Why do people suffer from anxiety? That's not a mystery. How is it that people can ever be calm? <laughs> We're breakable and mortal. A million things can go wrong in a million ways. We should be terrified out of our skulls at every second, but we're not. The same can be said for depression, laziness, and criminality. Did you want me to keep going? Yeah. Or where are we? Uh, I can start now. Oh, I can keep reading. I was just asking if you want to pause and talk about anything. Oh, yeah. So we've got Justice says, um, I have a... I have had time when I talked to a different family member because I didn't feel okay talking to my parents. Um, and yeah, that can, that can happen, you know, where you want an, uh, an outside person who's an authority figure, but is not directly connected to you. 
Uh, I've done that before. Uh, and Shauna says it's, it's good that you had that, probably found a more neutral territory. Exactly. And a lot of times they can say things that will touch you or give you insight that your parents wouldn't be willing to share, um, you know, because they have shame or difficulty talking about it one way or another. But the other authority figure that's close by, an aunt or an uncle or something like that, you know, a grandparent, they'll be able to say, now think about, you know, what your parents have gone through and, you know, that kind of thing. I, I, I've had that happen to me where, where somebody said, you know, you don't know, you know, and I was like, oh, I didn't know. Okay, that brings things into perspective. So, <laughs> all right. Um, if I can hurt and overpower you, then I can do exactly what I want, when I want, even when you're around. I can torment you to appease my curiosity. I can take the attention away from you and dominate you. I can steal your cho toy. Children hit first because aggression is innate, although more dominant in some individuals and less in others. And second, because aggression facilitates desire. It's foolish to assume that such behavior must be learned. A snake does not have to be taught how to strike. It's in the nature of the beast. Two-year-olds, statistically speaking, are the most violent of people. They kick, hit, and bite, and they steal the property of others. They do so to explore, to express outrage and frustration, and to gratify their impulsive desires. More importantly, for our purposes, they do so to discover the true limits of permissible behavior. How else are they going to puzzle out what is acceptable? Incident... Infants are like blind people searching for a wall. They have to push forward and test to see where the actual boundaries lie. And those are too seldom where they are said to be. Consistent correction of such action indicates the limits of acceptable aggression in the child. It is absent merely, it, its absence merely heightens curiosity. So the child will hit and bite and kick if he is aggressive and dominant until something indicates a limit. How hard can I hit mommy until she objects? Given that, correction is better sooner than later if the desired end result of the parent is not to be hit. Correction also helps the child learn that hitting others is a suboptimal societal strategy. Without that correction, no child is going to undergo the effort the effortful process of organizing and regulating their impulses so that those impulses can coexist without conflict within the psyche of the child and the broader societal world. It is no simple matter to organize a mind. Uh, Ryzen's here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So... All right, I'm gonna continue. Um, my son was particularly ornery when he was a toddler. When my daughter was little, I could paralyze her in, in, into immobility with an evil glance. Such an intervention had no effect at all on my son. He had my wife, who is no pushover, stymied at the dinner table by the time he was nine months of age. He fought her for control over the spoon. Good, we thought. We didn't want to feed him one more minute than necessary anyway. But the little blighter would only eat three or four mouthfuls. Then he would play. He would stir his food around in his bowl. He would drop bits of it over the high chair tabletop and watch it as it fall to the floor below. No problem. He was exploring. But then he wasn't eating enough. Then, because he wasn't eating enough, he wasn't sleeping enough. Then his midnight crying was waking his parents. Then they were getting grumpy and out of sorts. He was frustrating his mother and she was taking it out on me. The tra trajectory wasn't good. After a few days of this degeneration, I decided to take the spoon back. I prepared for war. I set aside sufficient, I set aside sufficient time. A parent adult can defeat a two-year-old hard as that is to believe. And as the saying goes, old age and treachery will always overcome youth and skill. 
This is partly because time lasts forever when you're two. Half an hour for me can be a week for my son. I assured myself of victory. He was stubborn and horrible, but I could be worse. We sat down face to face, bowl in front of him. It was high noon. He knew it and I knew it. He picked up the spoon. I took it from him and spooned up a delicious mouthful of mush. I moved it deliberately, toward, deliberately towards his mouth. He eyed me in precisely the same manner as the playground foot monster. He curled his lips downward into a tight, tight frown, rejecting all entry. I chased his mouth around with a spoon and he twisted his head around in tight circles. You know a toddler when they do that. Oh, no, I'm not going to. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, we've all been there. <laughs> so, uh, Samantha says, She's like a perfect kid, easy work. She insists on answering yes, ma'am, out of respect. Please, thank you. Kind of cringy. It's supposed to, I'm supposed to do those things. It's not a favor every time I, every morning I cook. Well, that's, that's different. Honestly, I'm blessed. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Um, and then Justice says you did an awesome job raising her. Yeah, if that's how she is. Yeah, you know, I'll agree with Shaman here. It sounds like you're doing it right. You know, if she's showing signs of respect like that, you know, that's, that's, you have the authority. You can be more friendly with your daughter because you already have the authority. Uh, and she's granted it to you and, and she shows you on a regular basis that, you know, she appreciates you and doesn't take anything for granted. So... All right. But I had more tricks up my sleeve. I poked him in the chest with my free hand in a manner that's calculated to annoy. He didn't budge. I did it again and again. Not hard, but in a manner to be not to be ignored either. Ten or so pokes later, he opened his mouth, planning to emit a sound of outrage. Aha! His mistake! I had deftly inserted the spoon. He tried gamely to force out the offending food with his tongue. But I know how to deal with that too. I just placed my forefinger horizontally across his lips. Some came out, but some was swallowed too. Score one for dad. I gave him a pat on the head and told him that he was a good boy and I meant it. When someone does something you're trying to get them to do, reward them. No grudge after victory. An hour later, it was all over. There was outrage. There was some wailing. My wife had to leave the room. The stress was too much. But food was eaten by a child. My son collapsed, exhausted, on my chest. We had a nap together. And he liked me a lot better when he woke up than he had before he was disciplined. <laughs> okay. You want to take over? Sure. That's so funny. <laughs> I got to say, I had to circle this. Um, Playground foot monster. <laughs> I think yeah. that's that's great. That's what a little brat, but that's that's funny. I like that description. Yeah. Uh, um there was something I commonly observed when we went to when we went head to head, and not only with him. A little later we entered into a babysitting swap with another couple. All the kids would get together at one house, then one parent one pair of parents would go out to dinner or a movie, and leave the other pair to watch the children, who were all under three. Whew! That's going to be a circus. One evening, another set of parents joined us. I was unfamiliar with their son, a large, strong boy of two. He won't sleep, said his father. After you put him to bed, he will crawl out of his bed and come downstairs. We usually put him, we usually put on an Elmo video and let him watch it. Oof. There's no damn way I'm rewarding a recalcitrant child for unacceptable behavior, I thought. And I'm certainly not showing anyone any Elmo video. I always hated that creepy, whiny puppet. He was a... <laughs> oh, poor Elmo. He... Uh, I got something funny to say about that later. He was a disgrace to Jim Henson's legacy. So reward by Elmo was not on the table. I didn't say anything, of course. There is just no talking to parents about their children until they're ready to listen. That's true. Mm -hmm. 
Two hours later, we put the kids to bed. Four of the five went promptly to sleep, but not the Muppet of <laughs> aficionado. I had placed him in a crib, however, so he couldn't escape. But he could still howl, and that's exactly what he did. That was tricky. It was a good strategy on his part. It was annoying, and it threatened to wake up all the other kids, who would also then start to howl. Score one for the kid. So I journeyed into the bedroom. Lie down, I said. That produced no effect. Lie down, I said, or I will lay you down. Reasoning with kids isn't often isn't often of too much use, particularly under the circumstances, but I believe in fair warning. Of course, he didn't lie down. He howled again for effect. Kids do this frequently. Scared parents think that a crying child is always sad or hurt. This is simply not true. Anger is one of the most common reasons for crying. Careful analysis of the musculature patterns of crying children has confirmed this. Anger crying and fear or sadness crying do not look the same. They also don't sound the same and can be distinguished with careful atten attention. Anger crying is often an act of dominance and should be dealt with as such. I lifted him up and laid him down, gently, patiently, but firmly. He got up. I laid him down. He got up. I laid him down. He got up. This time I laid him down and kept my hand on his back. He struggled mightily, but ineffectually. He was, after all, only one-tenth my size. I could take him with one hand. So I kept him down and spoke calmly to him and told him he was a good boy and that he should relax. Aww. Mm -hmm. I gave him a soother and pounded him gently on his back. He started to relax. His eyes began to close. I removed my hand. <laughs> he promptly got to his feet. Yep. I was impressed. The kid had spirit. I lifted him up and laid him down again. Lie down, monster, I said. I pounded his back gently some more. Some kids find that soothing. He was getting tired. He was ready to capitulate. He closed his eyes. I got to my feet and headed quietly and quickly to the door. I glanced back to check his position one last time. He was back on his feet. I pointed my finger at him. Down, monster, I said, and I meant it. He went down like a shot. <laughs> I closed the door. We liked each other. Neither my wife nor I heard a peep out of him for the rest of the night. Way to go. Right? How was the kid? His father asked me when he got home. Much later that night? Good, I said. No problem at all. He's asleep right now. Did he get up? Said his father. No, I said. He slept the whole time. Dad looked at me. He wanted to know. But he didn't ask. And I didn't tell. Don't cast pearls before swine, as the old saying goes. And you might think that's harsh. But training your child not to sleep and rewarding him with antics of a creepy Muppet or a creepy puppet? <laughs> that's harsh, too. You pick your position. You pick your poison and I'll pick mine. <laughs> All right. Discipline and punish. Modern parents are terrified of two frequently juxtaposed world, discipline and punish. They evoke images of prisons, soldiers, and jackboots. The distance between disciplinarian and tyrant or punishment and torture is indeed easily traversed. Discipline and punished must be handled with care. The fear is unsurprising. Both are necessary. They can be applied unconsciously or consciously, badly or well, but there is no escaping their use. It's not that it's impossible to discipline with reward. In fact, rewarding good behavior can be very effective. The most, favor the most famous of all behavioral psychologists, B.F. Skinner, was a great advocate of this approach. He was expert at it. He taught pigeons to play ping pong although they only rolled the ball back and forth by pecking it with their beaks. But they were pigeons! So even though they played badly, it was still pretty good. Skinner even taught his birds to pilot missiles during the Second World War in Project Pigeon, named later Orcon. He got a long way before the invention of the electronic guidance system rendered his efforts obsolete. Skinner observed the animals he, were tra he was training to perform such acts at, with exceptional care. Any actions that approximated what he was aiming at were immediately followed by a reward of just the right size, not small enough to be inconsequential and not so large that it devalued the future rewards. Such an approach can be used with children and it works very well. Yes, yes it does. Imagine that you would like your toddler to help set the table. It's a useful skill. You'd like him better if he could do it. It would be good for his shudder, 
self-esteem. So you break the target behavior down into its component parts. One element of setting the table is carrying a plate from the cupboard to the table. Even that might be too complex. Perhaps your child has only been walking a few months. He's still wobbly and unreliable. So you start his training by handing him a plate and having him hand it back. A pat on the head could follow. You might turn it into a game. Pass it with your left. Switch it with your light. right. Circle around your back. Then you might give him a plate and take a few steps backwards so that he has to traverse a few steps before giving it back. Train him to become a plate handling virtuoso. Don't leave him trapped in his klutzdom. You teach virtually anyone anything with such an approach. First, figure out what you want. Then, watch the people around you like a hawk. Finally, when you see anything a bit more like what you want, swoop in, hawk, remember, and deliver a reward. Your daughter has been very reserved since she became a teenager. You wish she would talk more. That's the target. More communicative daughter. One morning over breakfast, she shares an anecdote about school. That's an excellent time to pay attention. That's the reward. Stop texting and listen. Unless you don't want her to tell you anything ever again. Parental interventions that make children happy clearly can and should be used to shape behavior. The same goes for husbands, wives, co-workers, and parents. Skinner, however, was a realist. He noted that the use of the reward was very difficult. The observer had to attend patiently until the target spontaneously manifested the desired behavior and then reinforce. This required a lot of time and a lot of waiting, and that's a problem. He also had to starve his animals down to three quarters of their normal body weight before they would become interested enough in food as a reward to truly pay attention. But these are not only the shortcomings of the purely positive approach. Negative emotions, like their positive counterparts, help us learn. We need to learn because we're stupid and easily damaged. We can die. That's not good, and we don't feel good about it. If we did, we would seek death, and then we would die. We don't even feel good about dying if it only might happen, and that's all the time. In that manner, negative emotions, for all their unpleasantness, protect us. We feel hurt and scared and ashamed and disgusted so that we can avoid damage. And we're susceptible to feeling such things a lot. In fact, we feel more negative about a loss of a given side than we feel good about the same size gain. Actually, they know the percentage on that. You, are, you dislike loss four times more than you appreciate gain. They've done the experiments. Isn't that amazing? So four times you have to you have to gain four times the amount of something to offset the loss of one. And and that's why people hoard. That's why people are you know greedy. It's it's called the loss aversion principle. So um Samantha says, this is exactly why I'm on board 100% with Jordan parenting models, discipline with reward. He does it perfectly, in my opinion. Yeah, he's, he's damn good at it. I will agree with that. So pain is more potent than pleasure and anxiety more than hope. Emotions, positive and negative, come into in two useful differentiated variants. Satisfaction, technically satiation, tells us that what we did are, was good, while hope, technically incentive reward, indicates that something pleasurable is on the way. Pain hurts us, so we don't repeat actions that produce personal damage or social isolation, as loneliness too is also, too, technically a form of pain. Anxiety makes us stay away from hurtful people in bad places so we don't have to feel pain. All these emotions must be balanced against each other and carefully judged in context, but they're all required to keep us alive and thriving. We therefore do our children a disservice by failing to use whatever is available to help them learn, including negative emotions, even though such use should occur in the most merciful manner possible. Or most merciful possible manner. 
Uh, I'm in. Oh, what? I can't. Um, Varone. Got it. So welcome, Amine Varone. So, sorry, my my. I'm getting my double vision that happens sometimes with a neuropathy flare. So over him, I can. If that would huh? give you some relief. Would you like me to take over again? Yes. Or at the top of 132? Yeah. I was just looking back on the previous one. It actually that was a really interesting section about the anxiety and the using tools we have to yeah. not do the children to service. I mean, sometimes I even have to admit my kid to my kids, I don't always know what I'm doing and that something makes me anxious because I want them to see me overcome it so yeah. that they know they can get through things too. It, it's 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 a good way to practice teaching them that it's you can move forward. Even if something makes you uncomfortable, feel out of your skin, you can still do it and it won't kill you. Well, hopefully yep. not. <laughs> <laughs> Skinner knew that threats and punishments could stop unwanted behaviors. Just as reward reinforces what is desirable. In a world paralyzed at the thought of interfering with the hypothetically pristine path of a natural child development, it can be difficult even to discuss the former techniques. However, children would not have such a lengthy period of natural development prior to maturity if their behavior did not have to be shaped. They would just leap out of the womb, ready to trade stocks. Children, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be interesting. Children also cannot be sheltered, cannot be fully sheltered from fear and pain. They are small and vulnerable. They don't know much about the world. Even when they are doing something as natural as learning to walk, they're constantly being walloped by the world. Yeah. That uh, the ground can hurt when you land back down it when you're starting to learn how to walk. And this is to say nothing of oh, gravity. <laughs> <laughs> and this is to say nothing of the frustration and rejection they inevitably experience when dealing with siblings, peers, and uncooperative stubborn adults. Given this, the fundamental moral question is not how to shelter children completely from misadventure and failure, so they never experience any fear or pain, but how to maximize their learning so that useful knowledge may be gained at, with minimal cost. Yeah. In the Disney movie, Sleeping Beauty, the king and queen have a daughter, the Princess Aurora, after a long wait. They plan a great christening to introduce her to the world. They welcome everyone who loves and honors their new daughter, but they fail to invite Maleficent, malicious, malevolent, who is essentially queen of the underworld or nature in her negative guise. This means symbolically that the two monarchs are overprotecting their beloved daughter by setting up a world around her that has nothing negative in it. But this does not protect her. It makes her weak. Maleficent curses the princess, sentencing her to death at the age of 16, caused by the prick of a spinning wheel's needle. The spinning wheel is a is the wheel of fate. The prick reduces blood, symbolizes the loss of virginity, a sign of emergence of the woman from the child. Fortunately, a good fairy, the positive element of nature, reduces the punishment to unconsciousness, redeemable with love's first kiss. The panic king and queen get rid of all the spinning wheels in the land and turn their daughter over to the much too ni much too nice good fairies, of whom there are three. They continue with their strategy of removing all dangerous things, but in doing so, they leave their daughter naive, immature, and weak. One day, just before Aurora's 16th birthday, she meets a prince in the forest and falls in love. The same day. By any reasonable standard, that's a bit much. Then she loudly bemoans the fact that she is to wed to Prince Philip, to whom she has been betrothed as a child, and collapses emotionally when she is brought back to her parents' castle for her birthday. It is at that moment that Maleficent's curse manifests itself. A portal opens up in the castle, a spinning wheel appears, and Aurora picks her finger and falls unconscious. She becomes Sleeping Beauty. In doing so, again, symbolically speaking, she chooses unconsciousness over the terror of adult life. Something existentially similar to this, this occurs very frequently with overprotected children who can yeah. be brought low. Yeah. And the desire, the bliss of unconsciousness by their first real contact with failure or worse, genuine malevolence, which they do not, will not understand and against which they have no defense. Oof. 
Yeah, pause there for a second because I mean, all of us have known spoiled kids, you know, friends of ours that were spoiled that we then saw grow up and not be able to handle adulthood. And, you know, the, the worst thing in the world is to see an adult throw a temper tantrum. Yeah. You know, that, that's just beyond the pale. Um, and it's dangerous. You know, an adult temper tantrum is a dangerous thing. So, you know, these, these parents that, that, want to shelter their children and, you know, not have them ha have to face any negative consequences or anything like that. It, it's to their detriment. It's absolutely to their detriment. I agree. As much as I would like to protect my kids or other people's children from harm, I'm not capable of doing this stuff. There's always going to be something out there that they're going to encounter that isn't necessarily going to be pleasant. Yep. It's a, it's a fact of life. And the only way, I mean, what are you going to do? Follow your kid around 24 seven? I mean, uh, they have to be able to make choices. Exactly. Um, Lauren says, yeah, I admit my parents may have sheltered me a bit, a bit too much as a kid. <laughs> and survival says Karens have temper tantrums. Yes. Uh, yes, they do. Yes, they do. Poor Karens. Mm. Um, let's see here. Did you want me to continue? Yeah, go ahead. Take the case of the three-year-old who has not learned to share. Ugh. She displays her selfish behavior in the presence of her parents, but they're too nice to intervene. More truthfully, they refuse to pay attention, admit to what is happening, and teach her how to act properly. They're annoyed, of course, which she won't share with her sister, but they pretend everything is okay. It's not okay. They'll snap at her later for something totally unrelated. She will be hurt by that and confused, but learn nothing. Worse, when she tries to make friends, it won't go well because of her lack of social sophistication. Children her own age will be put off by her inability to cooperate. They'll fight with her or wander off and find someone else to play with. The parents of those children will observe her awkwardness and misbehavior and won't invite her back to play with their kids. She will be lonely and rejected. That will produce anxiety, depression, and resentment. That will produce the turning from life that is equivalent to the wish for unconsciousness. Oh, yeah. That's rough. Parents who refuse to adopt the responsibility for disciplining their children, they think... Mm, let me rephrase that, sorry. Parents who refuse to adopt the responsibility for disciplining their children think they can just opt out of the conflict necessary for proper child rearing. They avoid being the guy, bad guy in the short term. Ooh, that, that's not going to work. But they do not at all rescue or protect their children from fear or, and pain. Quite the contrary, the judgmental and uncaring broader social world will met out conflict and punishment far greater than that which would have been delivered by an awake parent. You can mm -hmm. discipline your children or you could turn that responsibility over to the harsh, uncaring, judgmental world, and the motivation for the latter decision should never be confused with love. Eek. That's a lot to unpack. You want to sit there and unpack it a second? Yeah, I mean, I think we see a lot of that going on right now out there in the world. Oh, yeah. With people making clowns out of themselves on Twitter or TikTok or Facebook, you know, just... Loudly proclaim, proclaiming what they think, what they feel, and a lot of those people turn around and get smacked. Yeah, torn up, smacked. Um, ratioed. Yeah, ratioed. That's a that's a rough way to go about things, and they and wouldn't, I don't think, entirely understand why it's happening either. Yeah, they're confused as, as to why everybody doesn't love what they say. Yes, shaman emotional immaturity. Yep. I agree. I really do believe there's a big difference between emotional intelligence and intellectual intelligence. Huge. Yeah. One's a social skill, one's a book skill. Yes. 
and you can navigate between the two, but even in emotional, there's, uh, there's many different, I think, aspects to that intelligence. You can be wise to people, but not necessarily wise to situations. And that again, I think is exactly why, you know, you need to start teaching them when they're younger and not necessarily with sharing. Um, that's a tough one for me. If you get a brand new toy and you take it outside and all the neighborhood kids want to play with it, you should be allowed to play with your toy and experience it when it's brand new like that. Um, and I've had my kids take out brand new bubble machines that had gotten broken in a matter, matter of five minutes after letting the other kids play with it. And that's very hard because who do you blame? Do you blame the child? Do you go running to the parent of the child and say, hey, so-and-so just broke this bubble machine. What are you gonna do about it? You, you can't. So you have to teach your kid, uh, even within sharing that there's reasonable boundaries with there. I mean, you, you open up the risk, I guess, with not only sharing your things with other, but the, sh the sharing of your heart yourself. That's like, I think one of the earliest steps of realizing when you share with society, you can get broken by it. Your things can get broken. It can hurt you. Yep. And you have to, I let uh, them figure out deal with it along with it. I mean, I'm, I'm having a struggle, hard time struggling with how to explain this, but I think you understand where I'm coming from, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's happened to me where, um, you know, it, you, you, as you say, you take something out new and the other kids break it immediately. And then it's like, you're heartbroken that, you know, you didn't have any sort of enjoyment with this thing. And yeah, it's, yeah. Do you, do you not take the next toy out and you play with it on your own in your own space in your own time so that you can enjoy it before you take it out amongst others? Or, you know, do a lot of times um, I've stepped in as the parent and said, you know, no, nobody plays with this toy, you know, especially if it's something like a bubble maker, things like that, where the kids can enjoy it. But no, you guys don't touch it. Leave the touching to the adult. I'll make it so that you guys can have fun with this. But no, hands off, that sort of thing. Um, and that can work. Um, but yeah, the, the idea that you have to share a toy of yours, it's like, no food you may ha have to share, you know, did you bring some for everyone? That sort of thing. Um, but a toy that's, that's property, property rights exist. So, um, survival says a lot of the poor kids I grew up with had very little parental supervision and they're doing pretty well these days. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny how, if you're a child that is not, you know, got one of those helicopter parents or those snowplow parents, you actually do a lot better because um, you got to figure things out for yourself and on your own. Um, Justice says facts survival. A lot of my friends who had rough upbringing as far as parents are great people minus one or two. Yeah. You know, it's it, so long as it's not so much neglect, um, you know, there, there's a, there's a balance there where when you come home, if you're still loved, you know, if it's not a hell hole when you come home and you're avoiding going home because of violence or other things that are going on in the house, um, you know, generally those kids that turn out very, very well, um, you know, and yeah, a few exceptions. And, and usually it's because, you know, home is hell and there's no sort of, you know, sanctuary to come home to so yeah i'll go ahead and read mantis uh where are we we are you, you might object yeah you might object as modern parents sometimes do why should a child even be subject to the arbitrary dictates of a parent in fact, there is a new variant of politically correct thinking that presumes that such an idea is adultism. Well, you want your kid to grow up to be an adult? Of course it's adultism. You know, that's the point. A form of prejudice and oppression that analogs to, say, sexism or racism. No, no, because you don't want your kid to grow up right sexist, but you do want them to grow up to be an adult. So, 
the question of adult authority must be answered with care. That requires a thorough e examination of the question itself. Accepting an objection as formulated is halfway to accepting its validity, and that can be dangerous if the question is ill-posed. Let's break it down. First, why should a child be subject? That's easy. Every child must listen and obey adults because he or she is dependent on the care of that one or more imperfect grown-ups is willing to bestow. Given this, it is better for the child to act in a manner that invites genuine affection and goodwill. Something even better might be imagined. The child could act in a manner that is simultaneously ensures optimal adult attention in a manner that benefits his or her present state of being and future development. That's a high standard, but it's in the best interest of the child, so there is every reason to aspire to it. Every child should also be taught to comply gracefully with the ex expectations of civil society. This does not mean crushed into mindless ideological conformity. It means instead that parents must reward those attitudes and actions that will bring their child success in the world outside the family and use threat and punishment when, the ne when necessary to eliminate the behaviors that will lead to misery and failure. There's a tight window of opportunity for this as well. To getting it right quickly matters. If a child has not been taught to behave properly by the age of four, it will forever be difficult for him or her to make friends. The research literature is quite clear on this. This matters because peers are the primary source of socialization after the age of four. Rejected children cease to develop because they are alienated from their peers. They fall further and further behind as the other children continue to progress. Thus, the friendless child too often becomes lonely, antisocial, depressed, or a depressed teenager and adult. This is not good. Much more of our sanity than we commonly realize is a consequence of our fortunate immersion into social community. We must be continually reminded to think and act properly. When we drift, people that care for us and love us nudge us in small ways and large back on track. So we better have some of those quality, some of those people around. It's also not the case, back to the question, that adult dictates are all arbitrary. That's only true in dysfunctional totalitarian state. But in civilized open societies, the majority abide by a functional societal contract aimed at mutual betterment, or at least at existence in close proximity without too much violence. Even a system of rules that allows for only that minimum contra contract is by no means arbitrary given the alternatives. If a society does not adequately reward productive pro-social behavior, insists on distributing resources in a markedly arbitrary and unfair manner and allows for theft and exploitation, it will not remain conflict free for long. If its hierarchies are based only on or even primarily on power instead of the competence necessary to get important and difficult things done, it will be prone to collapse as well. This is even true in simpler form of the hierarchies of chimpanzees, which is an indication of its fundamental biological and non-arbitrary emergent truth. So it's, it's like the, the lobsters. It's not something that we created because we are, you know, have cities and societies and stuff like that. This is stuff that existed pre self-awareness. Um, so Justice says, I got to learn more emotional intelligence. Uh, people say I'm wise, but when I'm left unsupervised, I can do some dumb shit. Well, <laughs> it doesn't matter how wise you are. We, it, we can all do dumb stuff, you know. I yeah, I've done dumb stuff while being supervised by other people, hon. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 uh, that's just being human, you know? <laughs> so 
Survival says, you're a young man, Justice. Trust me when I tell you, you'll be learning a lot in your 20s. Many ups and downs. Yep, yep. Uh, Shaman says, keep aiming high with your intentions, integrity, and standards. Uh, learn from the mistakes, rise above, and then so will you. Absolutely. That is some wise stuff right there. Um, do we want to take a break now? I can put on the... Um, do a smoke break because we're almost there. Um, I, I can't believe it's already been an hour. I've really been enjoying this. Thank you, Pam. Yeah, no problem. So let's pull up. Um, so when do you want us to come back? Uh, come back in like five minutes. We'll Can play do. And this, this song is really good, so. Um, I will go get myself another cup of tea, and I will be back in five minutes. Okay. I'm trying to find what, uh, what the name of this song is. Do, 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 do. I know this is the whole album. Oh, well, hey, I guess. Lauren got his wish. Lawrence, you got your wish. Pam and I did a show together. <laughs> there we go. There's this. Uh, now I gotta share this. Share screen. There we go. All right. Come on, don't. There we go. There's this idea that Jung had, which I really love, which is the idea of the shadow, the shadow, the shadow, the shadow. which is the dark side of humanity. humanity. Its roots reached all the way to hell. Hell, hell, hell. He meant something very specific by that. The metaphysical element was he meant hell literally and metaphysically but he also meant that if you were able to understand your dark side then you would see in yourself a reflection of the behavior that was present at Auschwitz and that the reason that people don't take the dark side of themselves seriously at all even confront the fact that it exists is because no one wants to see that reflected within them and no wonder pursue what's meaningful and you'll encounter that which you least want to encounter and that's well, that's the dragon the dragon is also something that lives inside you. It's not something that you take the encounter with lightly. See, I kind of knew this when I had my kids. I'd already undergone that to some degree and understood what it meant to be a bad person, a terrible person. And I knew that it was easy for people to hate their children, even though they might the words that they love them all the time. You don't want to set them up as an enemy against you. You don't want to allow them to engage in the kind of hierarchical challenge that makes you irritable and resentful. That's not a good idea. And if the things they do make you dislike them, the probability that they will make other people dislike them is extraordinarily high. You need to know what sort of monster you are if you're going to be a good parent. And if you think, oh, I'm not a monster, it's like, oh, yes, you are. You're just an unbelievably unconscious monster. And that's actually the worst kind. Your fundamental job as a parent, especially the child from zero to four, is to make that child eminently desirable socially. 
you're a successful parent. If, when your child is four, all sorts of other children want to play with him or her. And so then you think, well, what have you done for your child? You've opened up the entire world of children to So because they know how to play, everywhere they go, other kids like them. And will include them in their play and play the way that children develop. The literature on this is crystal clear. If your child is an outcast at the age of four, the probability that anything can be done about that is almost zero. No matter what you do. And then the other thing is, if you don't allow your children to engage in dislikable behavior, then adults will like them. And the thing is, if you're good to your kid in, in a real way, you can help them maintain that tremendous attractiveness that they have as young children. And then wherever they go, adults welcome them and teach them things and pat them on the head and smile at them genuinely instead of saying, oh my God, here comes that couple with that goddamn dress again. That's a horrible thing to do to a child. That's a horrible thing to do to a child. Because then everywhere they go, all the goodwill is spent. I mean, there's nothing that you can do to someone that's more terrible than to put them in a world where all the good will directed towards them is false. I think the echo is part of that song. So, um, yeah, and I can't, I can't uh, mute my mic because it, it will mute the music. Um, I've done that before. I've done a boomer moment where I muted my mic and Jordan Peterson was talking and nobody could hear him anymore. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it is tracked that way. That that song is heavily echo. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Check it out on your free time. Um, that's Akira the Don, uh, Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. And, um, yeah, it's, it's that... That whole album is just absolutely wonderful. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Justice says, I wish we had this more times a week, fam. Yeah, but unfortunately, I got other work that I need to get done. Oh, excuse me. My goodness. I wish I could do it more times a week, too. So, um, but I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. This is awesome. Um, uh, survival says read Jordan Peterson's books maybe or watch his videos they're all over YouTube it's like free college yes yes um, and at the Akira the Dawn music as well um, because he splices together little pieces of Jordan Peterson and puts it to music and it is I mean it's just absolutely soul healing stuff absolutely wonderful stuff so um, yeah no, no worries survival yeah <laughs> So, yeah, but, um, yeah, the, what Akira has done with the, that music and those tracks and things like that, I mean, they're spiritual songs, they're funny songs, um, the, the drinking song uh, with Jordan Peterson is great. Um, it's not based on any book, it's just based on um, one of his talks, I think it was with uh, Joe Rogan. So I'm going to play that real quick because we're waiting for he to be finished. Um, so yeah, this is funny. Yeah, and the funny thing is, if you're trying to stop drinking, you need something better than alcohol. And alcohol's pretty good. So you better find something a lot better than that. Esteemable people do esteemable things. It's like, yeah, well, you want to figure out something that you're doing with your life that's worth not getting drunk and screwing up. You might say, well, why do people drink too much? If you like alcohol, that's a stupid question. Why do people drink too much? Well, because it's great. So why stop? Well, you do stupid things when you're drunk. You hurt yourself. You, you compromise your health. It's really hard on the people around you. It tends to turn into a liar and it screws up your life. It's like, yeah, it's pretty fun. Yeah, well, it is. But you need something better than that. And what's better isn't being straight and not making mistakes. It's 
like that's all prohibition in some sense. What's better is, you know, you need adventure, man. Alcohol is an interesting drug. Consequences. <laughs> uh, all right. Do you want to pick it up, Mantis, from where we left off? Do you remember? What do I remember? I remember. Oh, good. <laughs> <sighs> Poorly socialized children have terrible lives. Thus, it is better to socialize them optimally. Some of this can be done with reward, but not all of it. The issue is therefore not whether to use punishment and threat. The issue is whether to do it consciously and thoughtfully. How then should children be disciplined? This is a very difficult question because children and parents differ vastly in their temperaments. Some children are agreeable, they want to please, but pay for that with a tendency to be conflict averse and dependent. Others are tougher minded and more independent. Those kids want to do what they want, when they want, all the time. They can be challenging, non-compliant, and stubborn. Some children are desperate for rules and structure and are content even in rigid environments. Others with little regard for predictability and routine are immune to demands for even minimal necessary order. Some are wildly imaginative and creative and others more concrete and conservative. These are all deep, important differences, heavily influenced by biological factors and difficult to modify socially. It is fortunate indeed that in the face of such variability, we are beneficiaries of much thoughtful meditation on the proper use of social control. Did you want me to carry on to the next paragraph? Yes, please. Okay. I have a doggy. <laughs> oh. um, minimum necessary force. Here, Here's a straightforward initial idea. Rules should not be multiplied beyond necessity. Alternatively stated, bad laws drive out respect for good laws. This is the ethical, even legal equivalent of Occam's razor. The scientist's conceptual guillotine, which states the simplest possible hypothesis is preferable. So don't encumber children or their disciplinarians with too many rules. That path leads to frustration. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I do. Limit the rules, then figure out what to do when one of them gets broken. A general context-independent rule for 
punishment severity is hard to establish. However, a helpful norm has already been enshrined in English common law, one of the great products of Western civilization. Its analysis can help us establish a second useful principle. English common law allows you to defend your rights, but only in a reasonable manner. Someone breaks into your house, you have a loaded pistol. You have a right to defend yourself, but it's better to do it in stages. What if it's a drunk, confused neighbor? Shoot him, you think, but it's not that simple. So you say instead, stop, I have a gun. If that produces neither explanation nor retreat, you might consider it a warning shot. Then if the perpetrator still advances, you might take aim at his leg. Don't mistake any of this for legal advice. It's an example. Stop there. <laughs> um, so yeah, do not aim for their leg. Uh, any cop will tell you that. You want to aim for the largest center of mass, and that's the body, because you can miss a leg easily. And if it's somebody who's, you know, you've got a bad situation where they're on PCP or crack or something like that where they're not going to stop if they're shot, you know, you, you want to, you don't want to miss at that point. And you also don't want to do a warning shot. Um, the way that you do it typically, I mean, hopefully it's a rifle and not a pistol um, because, yeah, you know, or it's a low caliber pistol where you're not going to kill them immediately, even if you shoot center of mass sort of thing. Um, but it's, you know, bird shot, buck shot, buck shot, yeah, you know, so that the first shot, all you're doing is peppering them with bird shot that, you know, that then, you know, gets, it's a deterrent that won't kill them. You know, it'll just, you got little BBs in your skin that you're going to have to pluck out and whatnot. And then if they keep coming, then you've got the buckshot and that will, you know, blast a hole through a car. And, you know, uh, if they're an actual real threat and the bird shot doesn't stop them, then you've got the buckshot that'll take care of business. But you want to take a course in guns. You, you want to go to the range. You want to practice. You want to talk to people about the, the proper sort of home self-defense. Jordan Peterson is very much a Canadian right now. When he writes that passage, he is being way, way, way too nice and generous and, you know, giving bad advice. So bless his heart, bad advice. <laughs> so, okay, go ahead, Mantis. A single brilliantly practical principle can be used to generate all these incrementally more severe reactions that of minimum necessary force. So now we have two general principles of discipline. The first, limit the rules. The second, use the least force necessary to enforce those rules. About the first principle, you might ask, limit the rules to what exactly? Here are some suggestions. Do not bite, kick, or hit, except in self-defense. Do not torture and bully other children so you don't end up in jail. Eat in a civilized and thankful manner so that the people are happy to have you at their house and pleased to feed you. Learn to share so other kids will play with you. Pay attention when spoken to by adults so they don't hate you and might therefore deign to teach you something. Go to sleep properly and peaceably so that your parents can have a private life and not resent your existence. <laughs> Take care of your belongings. Yes, because you need to learn how and because you're lucky to have them. Indeed. Be good company when something is fun. When, uh, bleh, sorry. Be good company when something fun is happening so that you're invited for the fun. Act so that other people are happy you're around so that people want you around. A child who knows these rules will be welcome everywhere. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty, it's pretty standard there. That's some good advice. Yeah. About the second equally important principle, your question might be, what is minimum necessary force? This must be established experimentally, starting with the smallest possible intervention. Some children will be turned to stone by a glare. Whew, I've seen some of those glares before. A verbal command will stop another. A thumb comped flick of an index finger on a small hand might be necessary for some. Thumb cocked flick, oh, a flick. Okay. Such a strategy is particularly useful in public places such as restaurants. It could be administered suddenly, quietly, and effectively without risking escalation. What's the alternative? A child who is crying angrily, demanding attention, 
is not making himself popular. A child who is running from table to table and disrupting everyone's peace is bringing disgrace, an older but a good one, on himself and his parents. Oh, I've been out to eat with people and had kids going nuts in restaurants before. Oh, not mine, not mine, but I, I've seen it. And I feel bad for the parents, but sometimes I sit there and I think, what are you doing? Yeah, what are you not doing? Yeah, I mean, and again, there are some kids with learning disabilities or different spectrums who would be harder, I guess, to... That just means make more time and, and practice more. I mean, that's not an excuse. True. Uh, okay. Such outcomes are far from optimal, and children will be definitely misbehaving. And children will definitely misbehave more in public because they are experimenting, trying to establish if the same old rules also apply in the new place. Yeah. They don't. Dogs that I'm sorry, what? Dogs do the same thing. They do. They do. Yeah. Not, they don't sort that out verbally. Not when they are under three. No, they definitely don't. Not when they're under that age. I mean, that yeah. also helps. Like when kids are under that age, you have them in high chairs because they can't get up and run all over the place. They stay put and you can feed them and teach them how to act. Yep. Same with booster seats. When our children were little and we took them to the restaurants, they attracted smiles. They sat nicely and ate politely. They couldn't keep it up for long. But we didn't keep them there too long. That's a good strategy, too. When they started to get antsy after sitting for 45 minutes, we knew it was time to go. That was part of the deal. Nearby diners would tell us how nice it is to see a happy family. We weren't always happy, and our children weren't always properly behaved. But they were most of the time, and it was wonderful to see people responding so positively to their presence. It was truly good for the kids. They could see that people liked them. This also reinforced their good behavior. That was the reward. Absolutely. Yeah. People will really like your kids if you give them the chance. This is something I learned as soon as we had our first baby, our daughter, Michaela. When we took her down the street in her little fold-up stroller in our French Montreal working class neighborhood, rough looking, heavy drinking lumberjack types would stop in their tracks and smile at her. Aw. Yeah. And giggle and make stupid faces. Yeah. Babies, uh, they have a charming effect on people. Watching yep. people respond to children restores your faith in the human race. Yes, it does. I agree with that, too. All that's multiplied when your kids behave in public. To ensure that such things happen, you have to discipline your children carefully and effectively. And do that. And to do that, you have to know something about reward and about punishment instead of shying away from the knowledge. Oh, pause. Okay. Someone said, my dad is 6'6 six, six and huge. All he had to do was say, stop that behavior and we would abide. Yep. Uh, Samantha says, Pam, I'm so curious what you looked like when you were younger. You're so beautiful now. I bet you were a stunner back in your prime. Oh, bless your heart. Yeah, um, I did do some modeling uh, back in my prime. I mean, I've got the COVID double chin now, <laughs> you know. Okay. And, and on top of that, my thyroid has cracked out. So that's part of the reason why I've gained 70 pounds. I need to lose about 50. Um, but yeah, um, there's some pictures out there that are pretty impressive. Uh, one of them um, actually won an award in Seattle. So uh, Samantha P says, I'm jelly. <laughs> Bless your heart. Um, um, Sean says, I'm pretty sure you, Pam and Mantis, all were. You're all still pretty. Aww. You're so sweet, survival. <laughs> and Samantha says, no, I bet Pam looks better on her best day than I ever did on my best. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you're such a sweetheart. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that, you know, because a lot of times it's, you know, the, the photographer's lighting um, and other things like that, that make you look good. Um, and you would be surprised some of the people who are models because your face in 2d looks different than it does in 3d. And I look good in 3d, not necessarily good in 2d, unless I'm really thin. 
Um, and I've, I've known some women who you wouldn't necessarily think they were pretty in person, but you take a picture of them and they're gorgeous. So, yeah. <laughs> Samantha says, stop being humble, Pam. Psh. No, bless your heart. <laughs> You're so sweet. And Shaman said, you're all smart, classy, and beautiful ladies here. Aw. <laughs> Thank you, Shaman. <laughs> you guys are so cute. Yeah. I like the Pam fam. The Pam fam is fantastic. Thank you. Very supportive. Very loving. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um. Part of establishing a relationship with your son or daughter is learning how that small person responds to disciplinary inter intervention and then intervening effectively. It is easy to mouth cliches instead of such as there is no excuse for physical punishment or hitting children mean merely teaches them to hit. Let's start with the former claim. There is no excuse for physical punishment. First, we should note the widespread consensus around the idea that some forms of misbehavior, particularly those associated with theft and assault, are both wrong and should be subject to sanction. Second, we should note that almost all those sanctions involve punishment in its many psychological and more directly physical forms. Deprivation of liberty causes pain in a manner essentially similar to that of physical trauma. The same can be said of the use of social isolation, including time out. We know this neurobiologically. The same brain areas mediate responses to mediate responses to all three and are all memorialated by the same class of drugs and opiates. Interesting. Yeah. Jail is clearly physical punishment, particularly solitary confinement. Such even when nothing violent happens. Third, we should note that some misbegotten actions must be brought to halt both effect effectively and immediately, not least so that something worse doesn't happen. What's the proper punishment for someone who will not stop sticking a fork into an electrical socket? Oof. Or who runs away laughing in a crowded supermarket parking lot? The answer is simple. Whatever will stop it fastest within reason. Because the alternative could be fatal. Yeah, it could be. Ooh. Oh, sorry. You want me to take over? No, I can keep going. I didn't know if you wanted to respond to any of this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've got justice here. Um... I have some disabilities and I use it a reason as a reason to conduct myself as an adult as as adult as possible so no one has any reason to say anything about how I act. Yes. That is spot on. When I do something mischievous, it's up to me to hold myself accountable and be remorseful. Yeah. And you can play. You know, it's not that being an adult means that all play is over. You know, it's being mischievous and things like that, if you have the the proper social behavior, otherwise people know that you're just playing and it's, you know, it's a way to um, make the situation more light uh, and not so serious. So um, Samantha says that can be the hardest type of accountability justice. Most find it very difficult, very true. Shaman says, well done, Justice. That's a solid mark to aim for. Exactly. Um, and then Justice says, survival. My dad gave us the look or the vibe, and we knew to start thinking about our actions. <laughs> exactly, Justice. Yeah, I was telling Mary Lou earlier today, you know, we were talking about some of the same things. And it's like, you know, when my dad got really, really quiet, you knew that you needed to leave the room right then or something very terrible was going to happen. <laughs> you know, it's it it just that, that sort of attitude where it's like, oh, you crossed a line. That was too far. Get out now. <laughs> so um, Justice says, yes, yeah, survival and people don't realize alcohol truly is a drug because it's so normalized. Yes and no. Um, you know, when you get into trouble with alcohol, people start to realize it's a drug and, you know, the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, they know it's a drug, you know? Um, the interesting thing about alcohol is that it's such a small molecule that you can drink enough of it where if you don't have the alcoholic drug before or alcoholic DNA beforehand, 
it will then give you the alcoholic DNA. Um, and that's because, I, and no other substance does that, you know, and, and it's very particular to alcohol. And alcohol, um, the pathway of, of alcohol abuse turning into alcoholism and the type of damage that it does to the body because it infiltrates everything. You know, opiates, they, they only do so much. They only cling on to the opiate receptors in the body. Alcohol hits everything. Every, you know, part of your body, your brain, you know, every organ gets affected by that kind of stuff. So, you know, it really is um, a nefarious, nefarious drug. So it's, it's no wonder that we, you know, had amendments that tried to ban alcohol and then realized what a bad idea that was and, you know, undid it. So, um, Justice says, so it's be a lot of people can't even say, I'm dealing with this problem and I need some help. Humility is a hard thing, especially as an adult, you know, because you, you, I mean, it's, it's so difficult to say and admit I'm screwing this up. You know, I should know better. Um, but for some reason, I just can't adult here. And, and the type of humility that it takes to be able to say that aloud is really, really hard. Um, you know, that's, that's why at the beginning of AA meetings, you know, people introduce themselves by their name and they add, and I'm an alcoholic at the end because you want to reinforce that idea of humbly admitting that we're not perfect, that we have a disease, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that's, it's, humility is hard for adults because we want to be competent. We want to be um, in control and admitting that you have lost control is a big deal. So uh, Justice says, if you do something you shouldn't and you don't feel bad when you know you probably should, there's something wrong about a person's attitude. Well, yeah. But the thing is, is that, you know, all the emotions that come up as a, as a, as a result of it, you've got shame, you've got disappointment, you've got anger at yourself. Uh, it's, it's a big ball of wax to handle that that's not something that's easy to handle. And, you know, the older you get and the more competent that you're supposed to be, the less likely you are to admit to an, a mistake unless you've trained yourself to do that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, as a kid, it's a lot easier to say, oh, I screwed up because you don't know any better. You know, you don't have the, the years of wisdom, you know, that sort of thing, the, the years of being competent. Um, so it's, it's a lot easier to say, oops, my bad. But, you know, when you're 45 going, oops, my bad, it's like, well, why the hell don't you have your, your crap together? Um, and so it's a lot harder to, you know, it's it's more like, I just screwed it up. Oh, shit. I do, I do. Play it off, play it off, play it off. You know, that's, that's what people do in their 40s. So um, survival says we kind of lost the topic we were on. Yes and no, because it relates back to how you deal with your children. Um you know, it's, it's the idea that it's really hard to be an adult um, in an adult situation sort of thing um, because it, it's hard to admit mistakes. It's hard to be humble. It's hard to, um, you know, realize that you don't know everything and that you're not working at your best. So Shaman says, uh, alcohol can be feed the demon, kill the demon, only to make the demon stronger and keep them along with the need to keep feeding them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but I don't want to get sidetracked on addiction too much. So, um, where were we in the book? We're on, um, uh, we were on, um, we'd just been talking about, you know, poking forks into electrical sockets or running off into the supermarket parking lots both extremely dangerous and yes you gotta stop that quick 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and dread. Oh. So you know where we are, so keep going. Um, that's pretty obvious in the case of the parking lot or outlet. But the same thing applies in the social realm. And that brings us to the fourth point regarding excuses for physical punishment. The penalties for misbehavior of the sort that could be effectively halted in childhood become increasingly severe as children get older. Yes, small children, small problems. Uh, yeah. Um, and it is disproportionately those who remain unsocialized effectively by age four who end up punished explicitly by society in their later youth and early adulthood. Those unconstrained four-year-olds, in turn, are often those who are unduly aggressive by nature at age two. They are statistically more likely than their peers to kick, hit, bite, and take away toys, later known as stealing. They compromise about 5% of boys and a much smaller percentage of girls to unthinkingly parrot the magic line. There is no excuse for physical punishment is also to foster the delusion that teenage devils magically emerge from once innocent little angel, child angels you're not doing your child any favors by overlooking any misbehavior, particularly if he or she is temperamentally more aggressive. Whew. Yep. I'll take and it from here. Um, to hold the no excuse for physical punishment theory is also fifth to assume that the word no can be effectively uttered to another person in the absence of the threat of punishment. A woman can say no to a powerful narcissistic man only because she has social norms, the law and the state backing her up. A parent can only say no to a child who wants the third piece of cake because he or she are, is larger, stronger, and more capable than the child and is additionally backed up in his authority by law and state. What no means in the final analysis is always, if you continue to do that, something you do not like will happen to you. Otherwise, it means nothing. Or worse, it means another nonsensical, nothing muttered by an igno- ig- ignorable adult. Or worse still, it means all adults are ineffectual and weak. This is particularly bad, a particularly bad lesson when every child's destiny is to become an adult and when most things that are learned without undue personal pain are modeled or explicitly taught by adults. What does a child who ignores adults and holds them in contempt have to look forward to? Why grow up at all? And that's the story of Peter Pan, who thinks all adults are variants of Captain Hook, tyrannical and terrified of his own mortality. Think hungry crocodile with the clock in his stomach. The only time no ever means no in the absence of violence is when it is uttered by one civilized person to another. And what about the idea that hitting a child merely teaches them to hit? First, no. Wrong. Too simple. For starters, hitting is a very unsophisticated word to describe the disciplinary act of an effective parent. If hitting accurately described the entire range of physical force, then there would be no difference between rain droplets and an atom bomb. Magnitude matters, and so does context, if we're not being willfully blind and naive about the issue. Every child knows the difference between being bitten by a mean, unprovoked dog and being nipped by his own pet when he tries playfully but too carelessly to take a bone, its bone. How hard someone is hit and why they are hit cannot merely be ignored when speaking of hitting. Timing, part of context, is also of crucial importance. If you flick your two-year-old with your finger just after he smacks the baby on the head with a wooden block, he will get the connection and at least be somewhat less willing to smack her again in the future. That seems like a good outcome. He certainly won't concede that he should hit her more using the flick of his mother's finger as an example he's not stupid he's just jealous impulsive and not very sophisticated and how else are you going to protect his younger sibling if you discipline ineffectively then the baby will suffer maybe for years the bullying will continue because you won't do a damn thing to stop it you'll avoid the conflict that's necessary to establish peace 
you'll turn a blind eye. Then later, when the younger child confronts you, maybe even in adulthood, you'll say, I never knew it was like that. You just didn't want to know. So you didn't. You rejected the responsibility of discipline and justified it with a continual show of your niceness. Every gingerbread house has a witch inside it that devours children. Go ahead. Oh, wait, let's pause to... Um, survival says, I think it's appropriate to spank your kids a couple of times if they're not learning from verbal communication. Yes, they'll understand they don't want it anymore and change their behavior. Yeah. Um, not really hurting them. It's more instilling a fear of remorse for misbehavior. Exactly. Uh, justice says makes sense survival. Um, and Samantha P says facts. Justice says, uh, my dad would often make me think and realize what I did. And that's how I was punished. Like we all know when your parents say, I'm not mad, I'm disappointed in you. That's worse than anything. <laughs> yep. Uh, so Ryle said, my parents did spank me a couple of times. I did not turn out to be a violent person. Yeah, no, the, that whole premise of, you know, to hit teaches hitting is just, no. To hit teaches limits. It teaches boundaries. You know, it, you know it, this bad thing will happen to you. And you want it to be the bad thing that happens to you to, to, to know where that boundary and that limit is now instead of when society is going to hit you. Because when society hits you, it's a mob hitting you. Or it's the state, the power of the state hitting you. And that will hit you so much harder than, you know, a smack from your parents. So... Um, justice says, I never got spanked because I'm disabled, but my brother did get so mad at me for some decisions that he got me to agree to putting my boxing clubs in head care. Oh my goodness. That's hilarious. All right. You want to continue Mantis? Yeah, sure. Awesome. Um, so where does all that leave us with the decision to just discipline effectively or to discipline ineffectively, but never the decision to forego discipline altogether because nature and society will punish in a draconian ma manner whatever errors of childhood behavior remain uncorrected. So here are a few practical hints. Time out can be an extremely effective form of punishment, particularly if the misbehaving child is welcome as soon as he controls his temper. Speaking of children, hey, stop. <laughs> um, an angry child should sit by himself until he calms down. Then he should be allowed to return to a normal life. That means the child wins instead of his anger. The rule is come be with us as soon as you can behave properly. This is a very good deal for child, parent, and society. You'll be able to tell if your child has regained control. You'll like him again despite his earlier misbehavior. If you're still mad, maybe he hasn't completely repented. Or maybe you should do something about your tendency to hold a grudge. If your child is the kind of determined varmint who simply runs away laughing when placed on steps or in his room, physical restraint might have to be added to the timeout routine. A child can be held carefully but firmly by the upper arms until he or she stops squirming and pays attention. If that fails, being turned over a parent's knee might be required. For the child who is pushing the limits, go tell your sister. For the child who's pushing the limits, hey, you. Um, sorry, puppy dog interference. All good. Pushing the limits in a spectacularly inspired way, a swat across the backside can be indicate requisite seriousness on the part of a responsible adult. There are some situations in, even, in which even that will not suffice, partly because some children are very determined, exploratory, and tough, or because the offending behavior is truly severe. And if you're not thinking things, such things through, then you are not acting responsibly as a parent. You're leaving the dirty work to someone else who will be much dirtier doing it. Yeah, I, it's just what we talk about. Yeah, you know, everything that we just said, he reiterated here in this in this passage. You know, this is this is exactly, you know, what we were talking about. Um, survival says, <laughs> go put your nose in the corner. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, I remember a four-year-old we were dealing with and he used to like to throw temper tantrums and he would start crying and doing all these things. And he would go in the hallway and he, he'd, you know, curl up in a fetal position on the floor and cry and cry and cry and cry and cry. And then he'd look to see if we were paying attention. And then he'd go back to crying and crying and crying. And we would just let him throw the temper tantrum. It's like, you know, hey, as long as you're misbehaving, you're not going to be part of the social circle, you know, go ahead, kid, we'll laugh at you, you know, but once you start to behave and act normally and, you know, in ways that everybody can get along with, you're welcome back, you know, plenty of hugs and kisses, plenty of, you know, playing with and all that stuff. And yeah, you know, the, the, you get to have your reward of being part of the, the group. But if you're going to throw a temper tantrum, Nah, yeah, you got, you're not getting any reward from that. So Samantha says, I was militantly disciplined, only made me resentful and angry, not violent, but I definitely acted out. Yeah, the discipline has to be correct. It's It's got to be, you did something bad. We don't like this bad behavior. You know, this is the consequence that happens if you fix it. But it it can't be um, you know, just random, like my mother, my sister and I were sitting there playing and arguing. My mother was hanging up clothes. We were just doing, you know, the sibling rivalry kind of thing. And she turned around and started screaming at us. And we were like, what did we just do? And we looked at each other and we're like, no, this is, this is out of bounds. This is, she's not, no that we didn't do anything wrong. She's the one acting crazy. And, you know, that breaks down the sort of authority that you have as a parent. You know, if, if you do things inappropriately, the kid will, will discount anything that you try and do because you've already lost that, that trust and that reliability, you know, that, that sort of, um, what's the word? I'm like, fairness. You know, if things aren't fair, then why the hell should we, you know, listen to you or anything like that? So it, yeah, it destroys that parent child relationship. So I, I can understand what you went through, Samantha. All right. You want to continue? Yeah, sure. Awesome. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for fairness and consistency. That's for sure. Absolutely. A summary of principles. Disciplinary principle number one, limit the rules. Principle two, use minimum necessary force. Here's a third, parents should come in pairs. Raising young children is demanding and exhausting. Because of this, it's easy for a parent to make a mistake. Insomnia, hunger, the aftermath of an anger argument, a hangover, a bad day at work, any of these things singly can make a person unreasonable. Well, in combination, they can produce something, someone dangerous. Under such circumstances, it is necessary to have someone else around to observe and step in and discuss. This will make it less likely that a whiny, provocative child and her fed-up, cranky parent will excite each other to the point of no return. Parents should come in pairs, so the father of a newborn can watch the new mother so she won't get worn out and do something desperate after hearing her colicky baby wail from 11 in the evening until 5 in the morning for 30 nights in a row. I'm not saying we should be mean to single mothers, many of whom struggle impossibly and courageously, and a proportion of whom had, had to escape singly from a brutal relationship. But that doesn't mean we should not pretend that all family farms are equally viable. They're not. Period. Here's the fourth principle, one that is more particularly psychological. Parents should understand their own capacity to be harsh, vengeful, arrogant, resentful, angry, and deceitful. Very few people set out consciously to do a terrible job as a father or mother, but bad parenting happens all the time. This is because people have a great capacity for evil as well as good, and because they remain willfully, willfully blind to that fact. People are aggressive and selfish, as well as kind and thoughtful. For this reason, no adult human being no hierarchical predatory ape can truly tolerate being dominated by an upstart child. Revenge will come. 
Ten minutes after a pair of all too nice and patient parents have failed to prevent a public tantrum at the local supermarket, they will pay their toddler back with the cold shoulder when he runs up excited to show mom and dad his newest accomplishment. Enough embarrassment, disobedience, and dominance challenge, and even the most hypothetically selfless parents will become resentful. And then the real punishment will begin. Resentment breeds the desire for vengeance. Fewer spontaneous offers of love will be offered with more rationalizations for their absence. Fewer opportunities for the personal development of the child will be sought out. A subtle turning away will begin. And this is only the beginning of the road to total familial war warfare conducted mostly in the underworld underneath the false fake aid of normality and love. Fasad, um, we've got some comments here that I wanna go through. Okay. So Shaman said, I hated my parents so bad because they were so strict with me. I envied the kids that were spoiled brats. I couldn't wait to get out of the house at 18. Then I learned the world is hard out here. Uh, Justice says, my mom was raised military too. And from 12 up, I grew up living in the same property. To this day, a Vietnam Navy SEAL, my grandparents, mom's dad, um, survival said they prepared me for a hard world. We are friends now. Yeah, that's the thing is that, you know, most kids are like, you know, oh, my parents are so mean. They don't let me do this, that, and the other. And then when you become an adult, you realize, oh, that's why. Got it. Um Justice says, uh, I've been through some stuff that stopped me dead in my tracks and said to myself, my parents said this would happen if I did that. Uh, yeah, yeah, and survival's pointing to that comment. Totally agree. Um, Samantha P says, I, we had an oak paddle, switches, hair pulling, food restrictions, and my mom's favorite, the brush. Complaining gets you, I had it worse, blah, 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 you have it so good. Yeah. So I do, I'm not calling you shaman. I'm calling you survival. I'm sorry if I'm slurring my words. I have a little bit of a migraine right now, but I'm definitely, I, I think I'm saying survival. So I'm, I'm sorry if I misnamed you. <laughs> so um, Samantha P says, my mom and dad have mental issues. It was not out of love the way you explain survival. Yeah. Um, and I agree. Damn, Sam, that sucks. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I understand growing up in a dysfunctional household where the punishment did not fit the crime um, or there was no crime when the, when the punishment happened, the kind of, um, you know, lashing out that was completely inappropriate. Uh, I, I get that. I get that. And that, can really, really screw you up. Um, it, you know, the, what it destroys in your heart um, is not easily regained once you do become an adult. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where it can make you more compassionate and more conscientious of how you deal with your own children because, you know, your, your upbringing was so screwed up, you know, you're, you're more likely to pay very, very close attention to getting it right than other people would um, who had it right. So um, <laughs> survival says, it's all good, Pam. Thank you very much for forgiving me. <laughs> um, Justice says, I hate the, you had it better than I did because some don't have the medical problems I have. So how can they say that that's better than another struggle. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's such a silly argument, you know, Oh, we had to walk uphill both ways in the snow to school. It's like, and, you know, it's all proportional, you know, the, the adults back then who were dealing with that crap have no idea what it's like to be mobbed on social media, you know, Oh, we had it better. You know, you just had it different. So, ah, here's what I love. <laughs> I'll give you a reason to cry. Oh, gosh. That one was brutal. Um, Justice says, uh, and who am I to say medical problems are worse than what somebody else went through? Right. Exactly. I mean, it's it's one of those things where it's it. we can't compare. Comparing is just silly. You know, it's hardship. 
we all have hardship um, and we all have hardship at levels that are differing. And, it, you know, it's, I don't know, you know, it's, it's just, we all have lessons that we have to go through. Life is not easy. Life is not fair. Um, so yeah, Shaman says, we are proud of you, Sam, for being the cycle breaker. Exactly. Exactly. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. So, um, survival, I know that one. I'm grown enough to know that they have issues. I can't judge them the same as normal people. And, and thanks, Shaman. Yeah, that's the thing is, is that um, it's that perspective. So, you know, the when we finally get to adulthood, you know, it's like everything changes and we get to see things in the full view of things. Um, and we're, you know, we can get out of the situation. That's a, that's a big part of it. Um, and, uh, you know, finding our own way and making our own mistakes and, and realizing things that, you know, we couldn't have realized as a child. So survival says mid 20 kids raising their children in the seventies and eighties. Uh, laugh my ass off. We're here now. Yep. Yep. There's a, uh, if you go on TikTok, there's a whole thing about Gen X and the, the difference, you know, because a lot of the zoomers and boomers or zoomers and millennials mistake us for boomers. And it's like, no, don't do that. <laughs> we are not boomers. We are our own thing, you know, and, and, you know, we were there when the internet was created. So don't just write us off. Um, but we do have some quirks, you know, we're not going to use our phone for our shopping list. You know, we're going to write it on a piece of paper, especially if it's an old envelope. So, <laughs> but anyway, let's get back to the book. Go ahead, Mantis. I still use the paper for my grocery lists. <laughs> yep. Um, this frequently traveled path is much better avoided. A parent who is seriously aware of his or her limited tolerance and capacity for misbehavior when provoked can therefore seriously plan a proper disciplinary strategy, particularly, particularly if monitored by an equally awake partner, and never let things degenerate to the point where genuine hatred emerges. Beware. There are toxic families everywhere. They make no rules and, no, and limit no misbehavior. The parents lash out randomly and unpredictably. The children live in that chaos and are crushed if they're timid or rebel counterproductively if they're tough. It's not good. It can get murderous. Here's a fifth and final. Here's a fifth and final and most general principle. Parents have a duty to act as proxies for the real world. Merciful proxies, caring proxies, but proxies nonetheless. This obligation supersedes any responsibility to ensure happiness, foster creativity, or boost self-esteem. It is the primary duty of parents to make their children socially desirable. That will provide the ch child with opportunity, self-regard, security. It's, it is, it's more important even than fostering individual identity. The Holy Grail can only be pursued in any case after a high degree of social sophistication has been established. All right, let's pause. Oh my goodness, we don't have that much more to go. Okay, go ahead. Okay. The good child and the responsible parent. A properly socialized three-year-old is polite and engaging. She's also no pushover. She evokes interest from other children and appreciation from adults. She exists in a world where other kids welcome her and compete for her attention, and where adults are happy to see her instead of hiding behind false smiles. She will be introduced to the world by people who are pleased to do so. This will be well, this will do more for her eventual individuality than any cowardly parental attempt to avoid day-to-day -day conflict and discipline. Discuss your likes and dislikes with regards to your children with your partner or feeling that a friend, but do not be afraid to have likes and dislikes. You can judge suitable from unsuitable and wheat from chaff. You can realize the difference between good and evil. Having clarified your stance, having assessed yourself for pettiness, arrogance, and resentment, you take the next step and you make your children behave. You take responsibility for their discipline. You take responsibility for the mistakes you will inevitably make while disciplining. You can apologize when you're wrong and learn to do better. You love your kids, after all. If their actions make you dislike them, think what an effect they will have on other people who care much less about them than you. 
these other people will punish them severely by omission or commission. Don't allow that to happen. Better to let your little monsters know what is desirable and what is not, so they have so they become sophisticated denizens of the world outside their family. A child who pays attention instead of drifting and can play and does not mind and is comical but not annoying and is trustworthy, that child will have friends wherever he goes. His teachers will like him and so will his parents. If he tends politely to adults, he will be attended to, smiled at, and happily instructed. He will thrive in what can so easily be a cold, unforgiving, and hostile world. Clear rules make for secure children and calm, rational parents. Clear principles of discipline and punishment balance mercy and justice so that social development and psychological maturity can be optimally promoted. Clear rules and proper discipline help the child and the family and society establish, maintain, and expand the order that is all that protects us from chaos and terrors of the underworld where everything is uncertain, anxiety provoking, hopeless and depressing. There are no greater gifts than a committed and courageous parent can bestow. Do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. And we're at the end of the chapter in perfect timing. Oh my goodness. This was great. Thank you so much, Mantis. I really appreciate your help today. Pleasure. Yeah. Happy to be with you. I lost my book. So Justice says, uh, my parents were amazing. Some other family members were supposed to be baking cookies with me and going to picnics. Instead, they were getting me shit-faced drunk by noon. Oh, my goodness. That's, that, 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 wow. Um, this Samantha P. says, cherish them, Justice. Uh, he says, uh, my parents are like gods to me. Oh, that's fantastic. That is fantastic. Um, I'm jealous. <laughs> Survival said, that's a great point. If they're, if they're doing something you don't like, it's likely society will dislike them as well. Exactly. That's his point. You know, it's, it, if you dislike what they're doing, think how much more strangers will object to it. And they won't be you know, caring in their uh, handing out of justice and things like that. You know, it's, 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 they're going to be a lot harsher. So, um, survival says, oh, Mantis and Pam Curtis, you're both so great. I appreciate you. Oh, bless your heart. Um, justice says survival. I was thinking my appreciation for our sisters. Oh, you guys are awesome. So we only have a few minutes left. If you guys have any burning desires, is there anything else you wanted to add, Mantis? Um, I think Jordan Peterson really summed it up. He, he definitely did. And I, I do agree with the... <sighs> I love my kids. I, I think most parents love their kids. Um I, I would really like to think most kids love their kids, but there's definitely also a difference between like and love. Yes. Uh, you can love somebody and not like their behavior and not like who they are as a person. And parents will be able to make that distinction, but somebody else out there, if your kid is being a jerk, that's all they're going to see is a jerk. And they're not going to want anything to do with that jerk. Like, yep. and, and they're not going to feel bad for mistreating that jerk. So, I mean, the best thing you can do is, is teach your kid to be a, a good person person you know a good well-balanced person exactly <laughs> speaking of <laughs> um i mean that's that's kind of what i've always tried to do with my kiddos because i mean i i learned those distinctions the hard way and you know i'd like to think i've always been likable but there have been times where i've caught myself being you know for lack of better words an ass hat and i've really had to put myself in check Yep. I don't want, you know, look, I luckily I've, I'd like to think that I haven't behaved like that to where people would commonly call me out on it and be like, hey, you're behaving like such. <laughs> Still getting cat interference. Sorry, it's distracting. But not everybody's going to. I mean, yeah. they're not. You're making me lose my train of thought, you goofball. <laughs> 
Shelman says, yes, it is well appreciated by myself as well. Thank you both. And also the great people here. Yes, you guys are awesome and you're adding wonderfully to the discussion. So I want to thank you, every single one of you for being here. Um, it's been a great time this evening. Thank you so much, Mantis, for, for reading. I appreciate it because, yeah, my eyes are a little cross-eyed right now. <laughs> I'm seeing so much double. Um, and, uh, yeah, blessings and strength to all, as Shaman says. And um, we love you and thank you so much. The time just flew by. It absolutely flew by. So you want to say your goodbyes, Mantis? Oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. It was fun hanging out with you tonight. Thank you, Pam, for having me on. And I love all of you. I love you, Pam, Pam. Mm. All right. See you guys later.